So thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Vicki Bloom, and I'm Dean of the Library here at IU South Bend. And tonight, we're going to have a student research spotlight featuring Patrick Finnegan, all right, Sabrina Lute, and Tonya Parson. They're going to present on their experiences working on anthropology digs in South Bend this past summer and how library resources excuse me, have assisted them in their work. So let me briefly introduce our terrific speakers. Okay, so I just said you were terrific now, so. <laughs> All right. And then I get to turn it over to Dr. J. All right, chairman of the, uh, chair of the Sociology and Anthropology Department. Patrick is a junior majoring in anthropology, archeology, span and minoring in history and German. He studies historical archaeology, specifically American colonization and urban archaeology. Patrick will be presenting his work on the history and archaeological investigation into a small South Bend city block at several conferences in the following year. Woohoo! <laughs> he anticipates graduate studies thereafter. Okay, so be nice to him, he's going to graduate school. <laughs> All right, Sabrina Lute is an anthropology major with a Latin American studies minor. This year she's interning with the Sociology Anthropology Department and looking forward to presenting at several conferences. Sabrina is, looking, is, is going to also continue in the field after graduation. So she'll be our second unhappy graduate student. Oh, you didn't hear me say that. Second. <laughs> All right, but that's great. She's particularly interested in the fields, <coughs> subfields of bioanthropology this is not easy to say. All right, bioanthropology and linguistic anthropology. And Tonya Parsons is retired from the military, having spent 20 years in the Navy. She's a double major in anthropology and history and intends to complete a master's program in Scotland in archaeology, after which she hopes to work as a museum curator. Her interests are Neolithic Scotland and the rest of Britain, as well as Celts, Picts, and Vikings in Scotland, especially in the Highlands and Islands. I want to go with you, okay? So <laughs> can I hide in a big, big, big luggage? Actually, I've been to Scotland and it was just gorgeous. Okay. Right. At the end of the event, please make sure to browse the anthropology titles on the display. If you see any titles you like, please check them out downstairs at the CERP desk. We ask that you take a few minutes to fill out our evaluation forms. Your feedback is always important to us in planning future events. And I will also note that there's some food back there, so we paid for it, eat it. Okay. All right, so here, Dr. Thank you. All right, so let me introduce a little bit about the background behind this particular project. Um, we worked this summer, and by we I mean eight students, myself, and a number of different volunteers from little tiny kids to Boy Scouts to a bunch of my colleagues' classes, their students came out, to some adult volunteers. We were eight students and um, we worked for about six weeks across the street from the, I'm sorry, I have to pause for a minute because it's changed its name, the History Museum of South Bend. This is the Kapscha Holm House the museum, and then the Studebaker Museum. You may have been around this area. It's on Washington Street. Um, so eight students, six weeks, and a thousand or more artifacts. These guys found a whole lot of stuff. Now, they were really excited. You might not be as excited. I've got a box back there at the end if you want to see some visual aids. Um, but it's a lot of rusty nails and broken pieces of pottery, and charcoal, and some animal bones. But they'll tell you about some of the other cool stuff that we've been finding, too. Um, so eight students, six weeks, thousands of artifacts, and an equal amount of curious stares. Because we're right on the road. We are right on Washington. And everybody is driving by. We were made very fast friends with the police officers because they were driving by every day and they wanted to know what we were doing. The woman pushing the shopping cart, the young woman that was walking to her job at McDonald's, all of these people were stopping by and trying to figure out what it was that we were doing because we had big tarps up and yellow caution tape and a bunch of students wore funny hats and, and that, you know, it, it makes you stop and think for a second. Um, so what we did though, 
besides just dig. And that's what you tend to think about when you're thinking about archaeologists is this, right? A bunch of guys with their, and a bunch of women, a bunch of people with their heads in holes. So I have the students here. Um, they are digging in this particular unit. This is our, our most spectacular unit. And, and the picture itself, if you're unable to see it because of the bright light behind it, it's OK. It's basically um, four young women, or three young women in a, in a small one meter by one meter square. So, but this is what you think of when you think of archaeologists. You think of these people out, out in the field. They've got a trowel. They've got shovels. They've got cargo pants. They're doing this job. Um, this is the kind of common conception, you know, working in the, in the holes of the ground. But it's really more than that. And that's what they're going to be talking to you a little bit about today. Because what I want you to, to go away with from my particular talk is that archaeology is a destructive science. We destroy our data. All of those artifacts that are in the ground, that's not what we're really looking for. What we want to know is the context between each of those artifacts. And as soon as we find that rusty nail and that pig's head or whatever it happens to be, once we pull them out, that data is lost. So what these guys are doing more often than just digging is recording and mapping and photographing and drawing and spending time in the lab afterwards researching what it was that they found and spending time in the library beforehand figuring out where we even wanted to dig. So it's more than just finding stuff in the dirt. It's very destructive. So the way to save time and labor and save archaeological sites, save our heritage, <coughs> is not to dig everywhere. It's not to just throw a shovel into the ground. It's really to figure out first what it is that we want to target. So instead of this, when you think of an archaeologist, I want you to think of this. I want you to think of a library database. I want you to think of JSTOR, some type of a online or in-person active search in the stacks to find the information first here in libraries before we go out and spend all of the time in the labor and get sunburned and sweaty and hot and ant bitten out in the field. So what these guys were doing was searching in the databases, either beforehand, mostly that was me, or afterwards, that's pretty much those guys, trying to figure out three things. Where we wanted to dig, it's a lot of work. We can't see into the ground. So we used a lot of work with maps. And a student will tell you about lots of really interesting things you can do now with maps. What it is that we found, and another student will tell you a little bit more about how we did some of the research about the stuff we recovered later. So it's not just the stuff in the field, it's trying to identify how old is that tobacco pipe? Or what does that tell us about the people that were living in this area? And then what do we know about the people who are living there? So it's not the artifacts themselves that we're after. It's the story of the people. And more of our students were looking into the story of the people. Let's figure out who was living there, what jobs they had, why they decided to move there, why they decided to leave. Build a story about the people in this area, not just the rusty nails and broken pieces of pottery and ceramics and all of that stuff. So that's what we did as archaeologists. It's more than just kind of sticking a trowel in the ground. It's sticking a hand in a database, and it's talking to people. We were doing a lot of talking to people. So three students will talk to you about the exciting things that they learned from this particular experience. So we will begin with the mapping part. We'll begin with the finding. And Sabrina Lute, it's your floor. I will advance to your next slide. Just <laughs> could start off with can everybody see me because why not start off with a joke <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about Sanborn maps that was something that was a really useful tool for us when we were beginning what we wanted to do is we had an idea of where we were going. We wanted to make sure that we got authorizations like uh, Dr. Vanderveen was sharing beforehand. Um, we do have to check in with places. We do have to find out uh, if the sites are already covered or if they're already um, established in Indiana. 
And then once we know where we're going to, we want to look into maps. And one of the best features that we have in this area is the use of Sanborn maps. And if you're not really familiar with Sanborn maps, uh, they were established basically as a way to estimate fire insurance risks. So they're scaled maps. They have stacks and stacks and volumes of them um, throughout a good portion of the major cities. And we're very fortunate that a goodly portion of ours are available uh, for easy access on uh, the IUSB library website. So there's a little bit of information on there and the link to follow it and then a quick little way of looking it up. Um, but to give you an idea of what they look like, these are what we were working with. So this little corner here, the one, there's two different maps here. We've got the 1891 and the 1917 maps. Um, you can see there's that corner that comes to an angle, a uh, very sharp point triangle angle, and that's where we were hanging out, is that little 51 area on the 1891 map, and I think it says 65 on this one. So each map has a key. Uh, you're able to reference when you have the main map of the city, it tells you which then map you're going to want to go to to get a closer view of where you're focusing, which then also gives you some plotting areas about how to focus in even further. Um, these numbers will not necessarily, as you can see, stay the same between the years. And then we also have some things like there will be things that are on there one time that you won't necessarily see later on. So what we were going for is understanding that our lot, for the most part, at least by 1917, was mostly abandoned. You can see in the 1891 map that we do have several structures on that corner. And uh, I don't know how clearly you can see it, but we have a grocery store, which is connected to a butcher shop. And then just behind the grocery store is a smokehouse. And then just off to what would be the west, of that is a smaller feature with is a tinsmith and a cobbler. And so we had some general ideas of where these places are based on these Sanborn maps, but what we also have to consider is that by 1917, or the time between 1917 and 2015 when we're doing this, a lot has changed in those years. So what we were, what we were able to do is at least have some general idea of where we wanted to dig, but we also had to consider what we're actually looking at now. So what we did is we used the magical, wonderful world of Google, and we were able to get some aerial shots of that specific area we were targeting. Uh, some of the things in these photos, as you know with Google Maps, Maps, if you've ever tried to Google Map like your actual living space and you see things that are there five years ago that don't exist anymore, we also had to take that into account, you know, because we were like going there like, okay, we'll go just past this tree, and I'm like, we get out there, and I'm like, what tree? Like, so trees don't exist, so we have to use different points to, like different datum points to measure <laughs> out where we wanted to go. You can see that angle isn't nearly as sharp anymore on that corner, it's been rounded off very nicely. Um, but it's really interesting to have these maps with some ideas of what used to be there and looking at what this neighborhood is now. So we have, you know, 1891 till potentially uh, 18 or 1916, we definitely see that there was quite a bit of commerce taking place in that area. So we had to start considering this area as not just what we see now, which is residential, but being a thoroughfare of commerce that people were using on a regular basis. So what we were able to do to make life even easier for us to make our ideas and constructs for where we wanted to start digging, where we wanted to put our units, was we were help helpfully able to overlay one of the Sanborn maps onto the Google Map image. And this took some really interesting um, work. Dr. Vanderveen did this for us, and we were watching him struggle with this even as he was trying to do it for us to show us how we were able to do it ourselves. Like, you have to make this into an image, and then you can kind of stretch it, manipulate it, and move it around. But basically what we were doing is trying to line everything up as best as possible. So this was using clearly the 1917 map. Um, but again, we had some general ideas of where we knew our target areas wanted to be. So as small groups, we discussed what we thought was going, what we thought were going to be the best places for us to find the most information about how people lived at the time. 
So some groups wanted to be closer to the grocery store. Some people wanted to be closer to um, the butcher shop. Some people wanted to be closer to the tinsmith or the cobbler. And we tried to figure out like, oh, are there, you know, with those blank areas when we were looking at the previous maps, you know, what do people do in the spaces that aren't being occupied? How do people use the space that doesn't have a building or a structure on it? What would be a common way that people would like get together in those empty spaces? Would we find information in these empty areas as well about how people lived? So we did not only digs right here where we believe the buildings once stood, but we also did some digging out into that empty space, um, what's called shovel tests. So very kind of quick, rough, dirty, ugly versions of archaeology because it's really just kind of digging a one meter circle with a shovel going down about maybe 40 centimeters or so and just sifting the heck out of it and trying to see if you pull anything out of it. So it's really the dirtier version of like what you saw before where everything was all very nicely being sifted and moved aside. But it was nice because we did find things. We found, I think, what was it, like a wedding ring in one of those, like a gold wedding band. Um, uh, we found old pennies and things like that. So it definitely had some traffic um, from this period of time. You know, and of course, when you're digging straight from the top, you're also finding artifacts that are a lot more recent. So we did have our fair share of beer cans and bottle caps and things like that. Fortunately, nothing too nefarious on the very, very top surface. But it's nice to be able to know that as we're moving <laughs> forward as anthropologists and especially as archeologists, being able to use these digital resources um, has been a great help for us because we're able to get into these places and do a lot more comparison in a way that's not nearly as um, difficult as it could have been at one point for us. We have this definite advantage of this digital revolution that's happening for information is really actually benefiting us to be able to find things and to be able to take information that's been given to us and that's been thankfully scanned and preserved with these Sanborn maps through the libraries and put them onto Google and be able to say, okay, if we're going to dig, we're going to dig with purpose as opposed to dig and just hope we discover something. Sure, there's that aspect of hope, but we have a lot more information backing up what we're doing. Do we have any questions about any of this so far? I'm going to throw, oh, go ahead. Yes, dear. Could you please point out on the map which of the triangles you're talking about? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I wasn't sure how to do that. Thank you. I wasn't sure if I was allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Vanna. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, so yeah, this triangle here is the one that she's referring to. So this is Washington Street. Capture Home is essentially right where my hand is. Um, she was referring to the tin shop where my pinky is. This is the grocery store, and the butcher and the smoke stop are right behind it. So it's this triangle here, and then on this side the triangle that by 1917 becomes blank. Thank you You're very much. I wasn't sure if I was allowed to come around. <laughs> Do you want to go to the next picture? Or? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this is the overlay with the 1917 map and with, uh, we so like we said before, 2011 image of the Google Maps. So there's some things that are different for us, but what we have the advantage of is if you can see there's this house structure that's on the, oh gosh, my west, north, north west. east side-ish, the, the duplex. duplex that we used. Oh, right. Yeah. So we're on this side, this duplex right So here. that duplex is in our 1917 Sanborn, and we can also see it in our 1891. And then when you're looking at the 2011, it still exists. So that was a data point that we were able to utilize to be able to find out or at least make some generalities about the locations where we wanted to dig. That was one of the major ones that we used. We were really eagerly hoping to find some images of the structures as they stood, um, like 
back in the day when you know we have the map for them in 1891 because there are quite a few pictures of you know Kopsha home and things happening with people standing in front of Kopsha home or doing things at Kopsha home but trying to find images of the grocery store across the street from Kopsha home apparently nobody thought to take a picture of that can't understand why yes. just one more thing. no of course could you point out where the the, the, the temporary the little circular holes were and where the big one we saw you know the, the one meter square uh, okay. yeah so how many we probably put in a dozen one meter by one meter units mm -hmm. um, you're on the mic you can talk about it a little bit more yeah but the one that you saw on the picture was right about here but we ended up going pretty much this whole south half mm -hmm. Well, it, for the unit that you saw uh, earlier with us digging in it, that one was, let's see, the closest one to that was probably only like, what, we started off about six feet, six to eight feet away from them. Um, so we had, those two units were probably the ones that were closest to each other at first. Um, I never really, once we got to a certain depth, remember how I was making that short joke at the very beginning? that wonderful unit D that we had that we were showing the image of got to about 160 centimeters, which in case you're wondering how big 160 centimeters is, hi. That's about it right here. It just went over my head a little bit. So I got the advantage of being one of the small people on the dig, so therefore I could get into the hole and do digging. So I pretty much spent the majority of my time over in that one general area and um, I never really got over and got to see more of the other units unfortunately so I'm not really sure how close they were to each other but ours on this side were six to eight feet at the closest probably more like um, 12 to like 15 feet away from each other uh, at the most on that one side. This pokey thing? Yeah. That is the tree that no longer exists. No. <laughs> Any other questions? Awesome. I am going to turn it over to Patrick. Patrick. Patrick? Awesome. He can definitely tell you more about the other units. He was very fortunate to work on several of them. Is it okay that I skipped ahead? Can go back to the oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Sabrina and Dr. Vanna Veen. Nobody got the Vanna joke. Aww. I was basing everything on that. <laughs> so that'll be all, thank you. Um, I brought this one up here that um, Sabrina had open uh, because when we got involved with the field school, a lot of people would pick different things to research in depth, and some of them were artifacts, some of them were places, some of them were people. And to me, when I got out there and I started pulling these things out of the ground and trying to learn about them and think about what they were, as we'd, we'd pull each one out and say, what is this, and what did it do? I kept thinking of the who, like, who used this? What did they use it for? I mean, who were the people? And I almost felt a little bit bad, like I was digging in somebody's diary, almost. Like I was digging in someone's past, and I didn't even know who those people were. And here I was, I was probably going to write a report on this for a class, you know, give this information to other people, and I didn't even know who it really belonged to to begin with, at least in my eyes. Um, so I picked the history of the buildings that were there and the people that occupied the buildings. That way, I would get to know who these people were, and then my classmates could know who they were, and then it could also fill in some of the holes of the things that we found, and vice versa. Things that we found could fill in the holes of the history. And for, we were very fortunate because a lot of those holes were filled in, and I'll refer to those here a little bit later. Um, some of the things that I used with the library especially were Sanborn maps, which Sabrina went into an awesome detail about, and there are some up here that we used. And the neat thing about those is because they're dated, and it shows which buildings were where, and also has them labeled. So for example, you'll see down here there was a tinsmith, and a cobbler, and a grocer. That really helped when I cross-referenced to find out what was going on there. And eventually I did. I found out who those people were. I know their names. I know where they came from. And no longer when somebody asks, oh, there's a tinsmith there. 
I know who it was. I know where he immigrated from. I know who his family was. And I know that that tinsmith came and gone, and another one came and gone. And then finally one came there, and he ended up having the biggest uh, hardware store in all of South Bend for years and years and years. So that's the start to another neat story in the city. And they all just kind of bloom from there. Um, so those are some of the, the holes I'm talking about that got filled in through the history. Uh, that happened with the Sanborn maps. It also happened with a, a lot of government papers that I found through the archives, and I wasn't able to load those up onto the Google Drive here because I use all Apple stuff, and for whatever reason, every time I tried loading a picture, it just got angry, and so I brought along my iPad, even though I was pretty sure that this would fill at least an auditorium, but nevertheless, I still kind of hoped that it would be small enough to walk around and show some people some of these things. For example, when I did find these documents, I started at home. So I just Googled some of the things that we'd found, some of these drugstore uh, owners, some of the tinsmith owners. And some of the neat things that we found, for example, right here is, I'm not sure how well everybody's going to be able to see it, but it's a patent that had been filed by one of the gentlemen that owned that grocery store. Which is really neat to me, because it tells me that maybe they weren't just a corner grocery store that kind of stood and people you know, forgot about over time. Maybe they had a lasting impact on the, the city above and beyond what we're giving them credit for. Because in the beginning, we didn't know who was there. We didn't know what they did. So this was just a kind of a corner, you know, grocery. We didn't know it, and it had been so empty for so long, we figured that there wasn't really that much to it. It wasn't a Martin's or something huge. And the neat thing about that as well is we can look at the little parts on it, and if any of them look too familiar, maybe they're parts that we found on the ground. So instead of pulling a piece out of the ground and looking in some book or consulting other people and saying, hey, what is this, and nobody knows, instead of it just being a mystery that ends up in a bag somewhere, we can see what it is, we can see where it fit in, we can see exactly what it did. I mean, a diagram is going to tell us exactly what it was. If the guy invented these things, it's very likely that he had one in his storefront. So little things like that is how we would fill in these holes and color the picture of the history that we were finding within the archaeological artifacts and with a lot of these documents. Um, others are just interesting. This one is a picture from one of the original grocery stores that these gentlemen owned. So that's nice too, it kind of gives us an idea of what the storefronts looked at like at the time here in South Bend. So when we find the artifacts, we know, did this fit in that time period, did it not? Is this something that would have been there? We learn about the people that were there. We learn, for example, that this gentleman that ran that corner grocery store, he went on to be part of a grocers and butchers association, so he was heavily involved in the community. And we can infer, a lot of it involves reading between the lines. And some of the things that we can infer from that is, like I said, it wasn't just a corner grocery store. This guy was involved in the community. And that kind of helps paint the pictures and put the color in that story. Uh, we find his obituary, and the other gentleman's obituary, Mr. Frank Baker, and then the other one was Solomon Fox. The two of them owned the grocery store that essentially was the, uh, like the, the main anchor of the entire lot of businesses. And I corroborate that information because anytime you get these sources, and they're so extremely primary, this isn't work that we're doing on Jamestown or uh, the Reichstag <coughs> Fire or something that's been written about repeatedly. This is all such extremely primary work that no one has ever, ever studied before that I would use the library resources to corroborate what I was finding, finding these government documents within the archives, finding other books, finding other things that would tell me, you know, yeah, this person did die at this time, or maybe they were married at this time. We can find marriage records and death records. And one of the things I used very extensively here at the library was the city directories. And if anybody's not familiar with city directories, what they were, and they're not as common anymore at all, they were very large books that were put together by an independent company, and the big company that did it after a while is called Polk. So if you hear them referred to, you often hear them uh, called Polk City Directories. And that lists like a normal uh, phone book does, all the people in the area by their address, and then it reverse lists all the businesses in order and where they're at, and then it will also reverse list the addresses and what's at those addresses. So that made our work a lot easier. I could go through to these things that you see up here that say Sanborn Map 1891 and 1917, and we know that somewhere in between there, there were buildings, and somewhere afterwards there weren't, and take out every single book for every single year and write down every person's address and everything that was at such and such address, which is the, the corner one here, the main one, the rock star, the, the grocery store was 901. And I know that those were odd numbers on the north. So 901, I could look up 903. Sure enough, I found a tinsmith. Sure enough, I found his name. And I could follow those over the years because they came out every year. Now I'd have to keep cross-referencing, cross-referencing, keep looking stuff up backwards and forwards. 
But nevertheless, I was able to find out who lived at every single one of those addresses and look them up and look up their families and look and see what they did. And some of them just kind of came into the area and they worked here for a year and maybe two and left. And some of them were immigrants and that's what they did. Others put down deep roots. And I was able to trace those roots and really apply this to the community, which was really, really groovy. Um, the nice thing about that as well is that you do involve the community. So some of these people here, no one had really thought about them for quite some time, and now they were able to do that. Um, I'm able to track down, for example, here, where Mr. Fox's son put in a contract to build a grocery store in Sacramento. So we know that maybe he followed in his dad's footsteps. More stories to help support these families that may have never heard those things. Some of the stories in the city that have never been told. Everybody knows about the Olivers and the Studebakers, but they don't hear about the littler people. And that happens a lot in history. There'll be books about kings or books about wars and soldiers and famous people, but very rarely do people cover just the corner grocer. And this is where I really wanted to do that and bring out that history and support it with the artifacts that we were finding so that their stories could be told. Um, yeah, if you're here, I found a great book here at our library that detailed some of the great families in South Bend at the time. And I learned that this gentleman that owned this grocery store had married into one of them. They were millionaires. There's a big long chapter here that tells about what they did and what became of them. And that kind of fills in the story so that this gentleman that moved here opened a grocery store. I mean, that's all we knew. But did he work really hard and save up every penny and open this grocery store and put in loans? Or did he marry into money? These are just little things that can help paint in those things for us. And then by corroborating them through you know, more documents, more things in the archives, more things in the city directories, you get a little bit better way of knowing for sure what the more true story of history is, if you can actually tell a true story of history. One of my favorite things are census records. Um, and the nice thing about census records is they list all the people in the house. They list the address, uh, dates of birth, uh, relationships. And again, on these, just like all my other sources, you have to be somewhat critical. The people that take these censuses are census takers who typically don't get paid a lot of money. And they have a lot of doors to go up and down knocking on them, and a lot of people maybe don't want people knocking on their doors. How much of this is accurate? It was all just you know, humans doing it, just like everything else. So there is room for error. More times than I need to corroborate some of my sources. And here, for example, we find out that, I can blow it up a little bit, but I, again, it would be nice if it was on TV, that the Fox family, lived right next door to the Oliver family for quite a while. So the chances of him being the poor corner grocer who worked his way up saving his pennies is extremely unlikely if he lived next door to the Olivers. Yet one more thing that kind of helps fill in those colors that I mentioned, and that he married into money, and that he lived next to money. So it kind of helps us paint the picture of who did live there. Was it this immigrant that built himself up, or someone who was just very fortunate? Um, I find other, if I just do Google searches, I find records where this gentleman owned a, an entire business, the vice president of a business, South Bend Retailers Gross, uh, Grocery Association. We were able to hunt those down through city directories and just trace the entire lives of all the people that occupied those sites as business people and see where they grew, see the other businesses they opened. I was able to go to those businesses, go to their houses, most have been torn down, but see where they lived and really fill in kind of this, the story behind all the wonderful things that we were finding. Uh, this gentleman's house, of course, was torn down. Which it seems like everything in his life was torn down. This, this business was torn down, his house was torn down, his second business was torn down, his third business was torn down. Nevertheless, I went to the mall just to get a feel for these people that were there. I went to where his house was and walked to where his grocery store was to see did he walk to work or did he have a car. And that won't be definitive either way as to whether he did or did not have a car, but it's still one more little piece of the puzzle there that later on can color in these artifacts that we're finding. And by the way, he would have have had to have had a car. That was a pretty hefty walk. Um, the other gentleman, though, that owned the place, he lived right across the street. In fact, the house that you see on the corner on the uh, 1917 map that's facing west, that's where he lived. Um, also, of interest I found was I was able to use some of the city archives to find records and documents. And among them was the the gentleman who owned the grocery store, Solomon Fox's last will and testament, so that gave me a lot of information. For example, did he leave money to people when he passed away, or did he invest it all into his businesses? And of interest, again, for the color, we see that his will was prepared by Jones and Obenchain, attorneys. As it turns out, when I met with his family and did oral interviews with them, I found out that about two generations down from him, they married into the Obenchain family, and that's where they thought all their 
local business acumen it came from, because they're all businessmen now. And they had all the family had thought that, that it all came from marrying into this open chain family who were attorneys and that I oh yeah, that's that's where it all started. I was able to show this to them and show them, no, 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 your family started way before that. And they did these really awesome things. And not only that, they knew each other. Because the open chain family prepared their will. And that was a neat little side point for them. It was something that was interesting for them to tell other people. This is what a city directory look, looks like, and it's kind of difficult to see, I understand, but it will list the name of the street, and then the numbers, and then the people that live there, and then list the uh, next street that intersects, which also helps to kind of locate where I'm at in some of these addresses. Um, you can see who live next door to them. Again, if they live next door to people of wealth, the Olivers, for example. You can look at the other houses that are on there, uh, the buildings that are on those sites. One of the interesting things I found out was uh, Again, when I got out of the library, I walked around the neighborhood, and I walked through its alleys, and I walked up and down every street, just kind of getting an idea of where I was, just the whole neighborhood, and blowing it up a little bit. Who were the people that went to this drugstore? Was this in a decent neighborhood? Was this in a great neighborhood? And in fact, it was in a very, very nice neighborhood. But as I walked around, I noticed a lot of different houses, and one of them had this very interesting foundation that was different from all the others, and I recognized this foundation. It was exactly the same type of rock and cut that the Oliver Mansion was cut in. So I thought that was a very uh, interesting tidbit. Went through and looked at some records, and sure enough, that house used to be across the street. It was this house, which used to sit where the Oliver's garden does now, which is why it's sunken in, by the way. And the Oliver's, I found out, had picked up this house that belonged to a druggist named Frank Busby, who was actually very successful, and moved it. And that's why that foundation is the same rock as the Oliver Foundation. I looked even more, found out they moved to other houses. So that also helped fill in our picture there. Just walking around the neighborhood, I got to get some of the idea that maybe they moved a lot of these buildings. And so when I knew that they had bought this land here, this triangle lot that we had worked on, it got me wondering, did they move our grocery store or did they knock it down? So when we find all these artifacts down there and we find them in certain ways, we can start to wonder, are we fighting in this way because those buildings were moved or because they were torn down? Sometimes we found a lot of things, other times we thought maybe we didn't find as much as we thought we would. And a lot of the stuff we did find was very, very, very small, very destroyed. So all those things kind of put together in the puzzle and paint the picture. Um, and I think that's one of the most important things. And one of the things I was really excited to be able to do is fill in that color to the story. And we had all worked so hard on building this, this spine, this, these outlines of, well, maybe around this date, this happened, and maybe this happened over here, and then we know this sat here, and we got some more information, but what really colored that all in is to add that history. That way we do have names and people and personalities and families that we can attach this to. And that was really great. We were even, uh, able to involve the community and have them out there see the sites. The families came out to actually see them and touch the pieces of things that once belonged to their great-grandfather, sometimes that they had never heard of before and they just had no idea that this history was there. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to either corroborate or change some of the history in the area, being its close involvement with the Oliver family. Every time people give uh, tours of the Oliver Mansion or mention things about their history, they'll often mention you know, that lot across the street. The Olivers bought that. There were grocery stores there and tore them down because they didn't like the view. And they'll tell these stories. And through our work, our history, and, and all the, the great work that Sabrina and Tanya have done, and everybody else, we're able to see, well, is that the case? Or was that a fallacy? Did they tear it down for another reason? And we just don't know. But that's what all that's for. And it's very, very cool. And that's how it impacts the community. That how, that's how it impacts us and that small area. Um, interestingly enough, I'm not sure how much it improved the view. It gave them a bird's eye view to St. Paul's Cathedral, which was uh, built by the Studebaker brothers. And the Studebakers and Olivers were not entirely close. So instead of seeing a grocery store, they opened their door every day and saw this massive, incredibly beautiful cathedral that we had the uh, good fortune to tour, knowing that the Studebakers took the time to paint their face into the window. <laughs> not sure how much that improved the view for them. Uh, but anyways, all these documents are available through the library, either this one or through the city libraries, and that helps corroborate what we do and really put a lot of these histories uh, fitting together and then supporting each other and filling in that color and supporting that color, and that's what I'd hoped to do. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out here, and do you have any questions at all? 
Not even one. Did a nice job. All right. I apologize again for the pictures. I didn't get them to upload, so I was pretty frustrated. But I brought my trusty iPad. Well, coming last after uh, Sabrina and Patrick uh, and their eloquent speaking, <laughs> uh, I have a, a much shorter presentation. <laughs> um, I want to start it out though with uh, resources. I mean, that's that's why we're here. This is a library, and we're selling the library, correct? <laughs> we're also selling archaeology. <laughs> um, so the resources. Um, as a researcher and, and researching these, these um, artifacts, um, there are a lot of different um, resources that you can use, whether they're in the library, whether they're outside of the library, whether they're just on Google. Google was a big one that I used. Um, but JSTOR is also another one, and um, Professor Van Der Veen briefly mentioned it. Um, one of the good things about JSTOR for a researcher is that it is free if you log in through the library's website. Not Otherwise, pardon me? Not free for us. Not free for you, but they are free for <laughs> students <laughs> and professors. Um, without that resource, it would be much more expensive for us student researchers to research all these different things. So that's, that's a very important resource for us. Um, the library, we could also use the archives and the special um, collections room. Um, I did not use those, but I could have if I needed to find more about pipes <laughs> or the people that make them or um, library Periodicals is another one. Um, a lot of journals, a lot of magazines, um, archaeology um, um, magazines like uh, uh, American Heritage and Historical Archaeology, things like that. You can just go and pick it up. It's a magazine on the shelf, so you can have a hard copy to look at. Okay. We briefly mentioned some of the artifacts that um, were found. Um, I think a few of them we were pretty surprised about. Um, uh, lithics, we found several different lithics, which are um, prehistoric um, um, projectile points. Um, we were surprised that we found those because they were so shallow in the ground. We thought that they would be many, many meters down. And we did find them, so we were pretty we were pretty surprised about that, and we were we were also pretty happy about it too. Um, but those were time, they were kind of hard to do any research on because they were pieces. We didn't have any full um, artifacts so that we could see the different edges and try to match what um, group of people could possibly have have made them and when they were used. We don't have the the um, technology here to, to date anything like that. So we didn't get to do a lot of research on that, on that one. Um, other things that we found, um, and funnily enough, we found them in those um, shovel tests. We found two very old coins, the late 1800s, and they were very, very shallow also. Um, late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, I believe one of our students did a, a research on that one too. Uh, we found a lot, a lot of bone and a lot of nails. Um, unit D was the, the very deep one that uh, Sabrina worked in and we believe that was a burn pit. So we found a lot of charred bones and, and nails and all kinds of stuff melted together. Um, they're, they're very innate things, but, or unimportant things, but they still excited us as archeological students. We, we were still interested in them and kept wondering why they had so many. Why would they put all that in just one, one little burn pit? Um, some of the other things that we found was broken pottery. Um, uh, we found an intact, bottle, like a medicine bottle from the 1800s. That was also very interesting. Um, I myself, I chose the clay 
uh, smoking pipes because my grandfather was a pipe smoker. So I thought that was be I thought that would be interesting to me and brought me back to my childhood. Um, so let's see. Okay, so the clay pipes. We found only one that was intact. Um, so we used that, or I used that as um, basically my picture. Um, the other pieces, you could tell that they were they would have been put together and looked just like the intact one. Okay. So we found like 37 pieces of various pipes. Um, and then we found the one complete one. And we believe they were made of white clay. So that's what I researched was white, white clay pipes. Um, most of the uh, pieces that we found had no ornamentation whatsoever. But there were nine pieces um, that had markings. They had dots or they had horizontal lines on what we believe to be um, the bowl of the pipe. Um, none of the pieces, including the intact pipe, had any type of tradesman or date marking on it. Um, those types of things are used um, frequently in researching because you can find out possibly where they were made, what manufacturer made them, and when with those markings. There again, we didn't have any of those. So it kind of, um, limited my research. These are some of the pictures. You can see the, uh, the fully intact one. They're not up there? Mm. Okay. All right. The pictures that you should see when they come up. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah, it's up there, but it's not showing up there. Um, our, uh, uh, after the field, we have to go back into the lab, and this is where we clean everything up and we separate it out according to what the unit was that we were digging in, and then what type of um, artifact it was. Um, so this is, the, this is all the pipe pieces and the intact pipe that were found um, and labeled in each unit. No, nope, no pictures. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, if you want to see them afterwards, they're, they're kind of interesting if you're... I do have some pieces in the back. <laughs> do you? Okay. Good, good. Um, let me go back to my... There we go. Okay, so the photos. All right. Because we didn't have any, any markings on them, as I said, it limited my, re my um, research. But going through uh, documents, other books, other journals, other writings um, by archaeologists and also um, people who just amateur archaeologists who are into pipe smoking and different types of pipes, um, I found a lot of different things that led me to um, some findings, conjecture, conjecture in some of them, but... Um, one of the things that I didn't realize, smoking, smoking pipes have been around for thousands and thousands of years. The, um, the oldest one that has been found in the U.S. was found in the Mississippi Valley back in the Neolithic time frame. This is, you know, 10,000 to 4,000 B.C. That's a long time. Um, let me see. And of course, there are very um, there are varied types of smoking implements. There are Native Americans really long pipes, you know, peace pipes, um, even um, normal pipes that anybody would use nowadays. They are extremely diverse in the different shapes, what they're made out of: stone, wood, any type of clay, or or anything like that. Many, or let's say most of them, are quite ornate. Um, they still make the type of clay pipes that we found, but they're not used very frequently at all. Um, the, found, the ones that we found, um, while they were quite common, it was because they um, were a low cost and low um, um, quality, so the normal 
um, everyday man who was low to middle class could afford them. Um, but they broke easily. Um, they smoked very hot, they burned very hot. Um, but one of the things that um, a lot of people, besides the, the uh, cheapness of it, one of the reasons they used those was because it brought a purer tobacco taste than a lot of other pipes um, that were made of something else, other, another, another material. Um, our pipe was molded in one piece, and that's also not normal. Um, it might have been normal of that specific type of pipe during that era, but most pipes nowadays are made in pieces. Um, and they can take them apart and um, put other pieces in there. They can replace things instead of throwing the complete pipe out, like our era people would have had to do. They can replace different pieces now. Um, one of the documents that I found <clears throat> um, was a gentleman who was an archaeologist in Ohio, and he had found um, a lot of different uh, pipes when he was doing uh, a dig somewhere there, and he described and photographed different pipes that he had. And that was the closest um, resource that I could find that would match ours. Um, and it put it at um, between 1870 and 1880s, and um, more than likely, it was from um, an Akron pipe making, pipe making company. Um, so I researched what different types of, or what different um, named companies made pipes back then. And one of them was um, H.A. Iyer's company, and that's an Akron, and then another one, and I believe that this is actually part of H.A. Iyer's, is the, um, the Akron Smoking Pipe Company. So without any date or manufacturer mark, that's the closest that I could come from where we possibly had it, had it made. Um, one of the reasons that it's also probably from there was because it's geographically, geographically local, okay? These are cheaper pipes. They're not gonna be made you know, in London or New York or anything like that coming to this area. Now, maybe Mr. Oliver or Mr. Fox, they might have had much more expensive pipes, but not the, not the local people, the people who are gonna frequent the grocery store and, and the, the butcher that you know, we, we were researching on our site. Um, I believe that is about it for me. Yep, that's all I have for you. Do you have any questions? No? I do want to say that um, I know that um, out of us eight students, uh, six of us are anthropology students, uh, and two were just, one was a um, liberal arts general, and the other one I think she was um, not sure what she was doing. All eight of us students were extremely proud of what we did and really, really enjoyed it, even the ones that weren't really interested in, in anthropology. So I, I think that this was um, very good for us educationally, but I think it was also good for us um, as people too. And Patrick, um, <clears throat> when Patrick came and told us about all the information that he had dug up and that he had spoken to the families and how excited they were about the information that he had found, we just even got more excited about the whole, the whole dig. So thank you for all of that. <laughs> a debut and um, please fill out the evaluation form please eat the food please check all the displays and thank you very much for coming <laughs>